Hello there. I'm going to be reviewing the book Codependence No More, which is by Melody Beatty. Wonderful book from the 80s. Um, pretty much the first work that really helped us understand um, and put an umbrella term to the experience of codependency. For the sake of a timestamp, um, if you're watching this on replay, we're in about the fourth week of quarantine at the moment. It's mid-April 2020. <coughs> And I'm uh, weekly just going through books which I feel really open up uh, understanding, connections, connect dots, and really have just very touched, touched me very much over the years, and, and I think there's a lot to impart from there. So this book, uh, Codependency No More, this is not a hard psychology book. Um, nonetheless, I feel it's very, very important. The tagline of this book, and if you're seeing it for the first time, this is Codependency No More, forgive me, it's inverted there. Codependency No More, um, how to stop controlling others and start taking care of yourself. That's the, that's the tagline of this book. Um, I, it, I avoided this book for the longest time, I really did. <laughs> um, I, had, uh, I had a resistance to that word, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but I really appreciate that this work gives voice to the people of the world who experience this thing called codependency. It would be very very, um, a very restrictive experience. Uh, for me, that, that word, that word, is like if I just distinct, make distinct codependency the word from codependency the behavior, uh, behaviors, I should say, I have mixed feelings about the word, okay? I have mixed feelings about it. I think it's important to know this word. I just feel I've heard the word misused um, a little too often in my life, I feel it's used like a weapon, um, like an accusation or a judgment, as it were. That's how I've heard that word used in, in, in connection with other people, which makes me feel sad. Um, but that said, that said, um, that said, there's a, there's a lot there. Anyway, Melody Beatty herself, Melody Beatty, she, uh, in 1973, by 1973, she had had some kind some type of chemical dependency for about 10 years okay that's where she enters this she, she's not an expert but she had experienced chemical dependency for an awfully long time which led her and i guess her family and community and friends around her the experiences she was having to write this book from her experiences and from her time in 12 step okay now the she published this book in 1986 and since then the book's gone on to sell millions. It's really been a very, very, um, very, very popular book. In 1986, um, the word codependency or codependent was not a familiar term. Now it comes up if you spell check it. <laughs> it's, that, it's that familiar. In her words, she wanted to convey this information, not in a hard scientific way, because the book's gotten criticized for that, right? Not in a hard scientific way, but in a warm, non-judgmental and gentle way and I deeply appreciate this work for that alone. Um, for me to take you through this book now, um, yes I have to I have to touch on several of the um, I have to touch on several of the issues that she covers. I have to I have to do it justice. I have to do it justice. And where, where possible, I shall be subjective about it because I think it's important to pass on one's own uh, feelings and perspectives there too. That's what really lands for people. So anyway, the book starts with a collection of stories and you very quickly understand that the sort of people that are going through this experience called codependency, these are not the alcoholics, these are not the chemical dependents, these are the wives of the alcoholics, the employees of the alcoholics and so on the friends, the children, as it were. They're those people, the people that haven't had the voice, the people that aren't making the big noise in society, aren't causing the big problems, but are going through this, but are going through this experience. So, I'm gonna have to talk about it at some point. Codependency, let's go there, let's go there. So, there are a lot of definitions of codependency. I'm gonna drill this down a little bit. The, the, the definition that she goes for, and I like this one, it is one who has let another's behavior affect them, one who has let someone else's behavior affect them, 
and is obsessed with controlling that behavior. Okay, let me just, let me just, let me just go through that again. Um, one who is obsessed with someone else's, but sorry, one who is affected by someone else's behavior and is obsessed with controlling that behavior. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll go through, I'll, I'll repeat certain points as I go through this so you, you get the gist as it were. But we've always got someone else involved in this and we've always got a degree of control in this as well. There's some debate as to whether codependency is an illness, is a disease. Um, I'm on the fence with that myself. Um, I see, I very much see both sides. Um, it's because it's very hard to, to quantify, okay, because people could have a number of, a number of codependent, um, uh, or, or exhibit a number of codependent behaviors. I do. <laughs> I probably have done in the time you've been watching this. Um, but it's not an exact science, is it? And I'll, and I'll get on to that in a minute. But anyway, there's debate as to, as to whether it is an illness, disease, that sort of thing. And people say that because it is a progressive thing, because you live with and know people um, whose behavior you um, react to, okay? And then there's this word reactivity. Reactivity is gonna come up a bunch of times as I go through this today. The, it's a tricky area because codependents or people who ex exhibit and express a number of codependent tendencies, we would call them probably good people, okay? Doing good things, they're helpful people. Um, it's just that there is an overexpression of that, a denial of self and overexpression of that. So, I'm gonna have to, just a couple of times as I go through this, I have to get into a couple of lists, so humor me if you will, okay? Um, the first of all, the first one is about behaviors. Sorry, the characteristics of codependence. And let me just get through this quickly, all right? We've got the caretakers, we've got the we've got denial, we've got repression, we've got low self-esteem, we've got obsession, we've got distrust, we've got poor communication, we've got anger, and we've got the progressive nature of it. We've got this going on over time. And of course, control. Um, the Behaviors are a little more interesting because this is sort of where one can one can recognize oneself in it. And before I go through this, let me just say, a long, 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 long time ago, I was a psychology major, a long, a long time ago. And if you've ever studied psychology and you read these things, um, whatever the whatever the uh, subject you're reading in psychology, there is a frustrating tendency to to go, yeah, I've got that and that and that and that and that <laughs> when you read it. So let me just touch on some of the behaviors. We've got the behavior of feeling more safe giving while insecure receiving. We've got feeling over responsible for someone else's well-being, thoughts, emotions. Uh, we've got attracting neediness to us. We've got the habit of saying yes when we mean no. Uh, we've got the habit of abandoning one's routine to help someone else. Someone asks for help and we go, yes, drop what we're doing and go and help someone, excuse me, go and help someone else. We abandon ourselves to support someone else. And the list goes on, but you're probably getting the gist of it over here. You're probably getting the gist of it. I'm not gonna spend I'm not going to spend too long talking about codependency in itself. The book's called Codependency No More. To talk about, to talk about um, the release of it without talking about the issue does not do this justice. To talk about the issue without talking about the release does not do it justice. Um, I feel the key with a work like this is the space in between those two words, codependent and no more. I don't feel that you could just read this thing and say, I'm not codependent anymore now. <laughs> I don't think it works like that. I don't think these, works, these things work like that. Um, the, the, um, there's, there's the fibers and grids of energy that, that tangle these things up, they don't just disappear in, in, in one shot. It takes, it takes some working through these things. We'll talk about that later. So anyway, I've just talked about basically the first half of this book. The second half about uh, the second half of this book is pretty much about the basics of self-care. 
self-care because that is what unwinds these behaviors uh, that 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 um, accumulate together to the experience and definition of codependency right so the first one she talks about is detachment and detachment if you're coming across that word for the first time we're not talking about something cold we're not talking about being clinical unkind or anything like that we're talking about being present with detachment so you're very much with someone but you're not attached to their experience you're not attached to their um, roller coaster as it were you're present with it but not attached but not attaching your well-being or your centeredness to it that's the first one um, another one she calls it don't be blown about by every wind I like that and the point she's making here is in with codependency a a characteristic that comes up a lot is the person let's just say me vacillates a lot in what they think isn't really sure what they think isn't really sure what they feel and so we are um, we are very attached to this other person and depend and draw our center on what they're feeling and so the key here is to bring it back to ourself and be sh more sure of what we think and feel want and so on and then we're not blown about by this wind so to speak um, She's got a section, she calls it, remove the victim, okay? Now be as clear as, I'll try and be as clear as I can here. So there is a model called the Cartman Triangle of uh, Drama. The Cartman Triangle of Drama, okay? And there we've got the rescuer, we've got the victim, and we've got the persecutor. And what she's kind of explaining, conveying here, is that the codependent is usually one of those people. Is either, is either expressing as the victim, expressing as the persecutor, blaming, okay, um, or trying to rescue. Trying to rescue, <laughs> trying to rescue, then blaming, and then taking, this, taking the space of a victim. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't fun stuff, but this is stuff that people go through all the time. And it's a voice that is hard to, um, it's an experience that is hard to articulate. So no one knows how many people are going through something like so that's the Cartman triangle of uh, drama. We got, we got, we got someone either taking the place of the rescuer, or the persecutor, or the victim. Right? Um, she coins this expression, <laughs> undependence, undependence. Okay, not independence, but undependence. And this is a, this is the process, however you take it, of unwinding whatever it was that was the source or basis of the experience that led you to have the expression of codependency. So we're talking about inner child work here, this sort of thing, okay? Um, let's see what else. Uh, she's talking about living, this is word own, O-W-N, okay? And that word comes up all the time in this book, O-W-N. Living your own life, thinking your own thoughts, feeling your own feelings, okay? It's all about bringing it back to yourself, bringing it back to yourself. And I'm saving you pages and pages here, <laughs> by the way, because I don't want to just read stuff to you. I want to just uh, explain explain the, the, the key points. It's very useful, because a book like this, you're not going to take it all in in one shot, are you? How could you? How could you? Um, so nearly there, nearly there, acceptance. There's a big chunk of this book uh, dedicated, devoted to acceptance. And we've got the five stages, and she equates it to the five stages of grief. We've got denial, anger, bargaining, uh, depression, and, uh, and finally acceptance. If you've ever gone through grief, and I'm sure you have, whether it's bereavement, loss of a job, divorce, all of the above, you know, and I'm glad to say she points this out too, that you don't just go one, two, three, four, five, you go one, three, two, one, five, four, five, four, you know, like that. It's, it's not a, um, it's not a linear, logical, um, uh, uh, um, predictable process dealing with grief. It comes out as it comes out. It moves as it moves. Uh, and sh and the, the, the art of acceptance, as she's coining it, is the same. 
And when you're so embroiled with someone to the extent that you're experiencing and exhibiting codependent uh, behaviors in other areas of your life, that's going to take that's going to take a while. That's going to take a while and consistent effort and love to to unwind from yourself. Let me see what else is there. As she talks about communication, communication is the key, pretty much, to to um, to resolving to resolving codependent behaviors. Because really, you just have to start talking. You have to start talking. Uh, 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 for myself, for my own life, um, I haven't wanted to. I haven't wanted to. When I've dealt with narcissistic people, dominating people, bullies and so on, I haven't wanted to talk. That's what I grew up with, right? I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to voice and so on. But communication will always breed and breathe more of itself. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. She talks a lot about the 12-step program. She benefited tremendously from. And that, um, that model... That model can be applied in different ways to different things that one goes through. I'm not going to get into it now. Um, I've not ever gone through recovery. Um, people speak in, uh, enormously uh, positively. <laughs> there was that word. Uh, enormously positive about the 12-step process for different ways and reasons and so on. Um, so, so just to just to wrap this up then. At this time, so in mid-April, we as a global collective are going through something we've never been through before. We've never been through this. Um, uh, the unknowns of the future, the being at home for an extended period of time with people we maybe don't see so often. It's different for me. I always see Anna and the kids. It's <laughs> not so different for me. But these things, the, 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 the more buried and repressed feelings are for a lot of people, because I'm talking to a lot of people, they're coming up to the surface and people are not sure what to do with these things. And codependency is a extremely loud, silent voice, if that makes sense. So, this book, Codependent No More, I feel it's a very important work. I'd almost go as far to say I wish they taught it at school. I wish they taught this to seniors. Um, I think it's that important, I really do. Um, her voice, uh, Melody Beattie's voice in this book is very gentle, it's very kind, and we're dealing with very heavy topics and subjects in this book. Um, alcoholism, abuse, neglect, um, it's not fun stuff, but she goes through it in a very direct and kind way. I think her final words in this book are, don't give up hope, don't give, don't give up hope. and. She says, you know, it's not our fault. It's not our fault what has happened to us, but it is our responsibility not to, it is our responsibility to address it, to resolve it as best we can, that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get broadcast onto other people. I believe a more, a more uh, popular expression is, um, it's not your fault that you were cut, but that doesn't give you the right to bleed onto other people. You may have heard that before. What else to say? I don't have more, much more to say, actually. Life is funny. Life is funny. Even today, I was going through my own processing. Stuff came up from like 22 years ago. Stuff I hadn't thought about for 22 years, 21, 22 years that particular phase of my life and um, the the causal bodies and where memories and events and situations get stored wherever that is if it even is out here when that stuff's ready to pop and lick and release and come to the surface it's ready and I think no I don't think spiritual maturity the spiritual warrior is about is about hold, not holding on to that but getting your hands on that and loving it and as I say, I avoided this book for so long. I didn't want to own codependency. I wouldn't want to own those, those characteristics about myself. And life is a ton easier when you do, because 
whatever you might label yourself as, or label people you love, or label people you don't love, whatever that is, that's, that is stuff that is getting worn out through the very great love and grace of time. So, I think that will do. I do recommend it, I do recommend it. Um, with other books I'm talking about, I, I suggest people to listen to lectures of the author, um, read, uh, listen to the audio perhaps, but I don't really think that about this one. It, it, it's it's um, self-encompassing. It will, if it's not a challenging book, it certainly is a stimulating one, a stimulating one, and it will trigger, it will trigger memories, thoughts, and that is a good thing. All right, well, <laughs> thank you for listening. Um, I wish you a wonderful rest of the day, and um, uh, if you're enjoying this, then I'll see you next week.